on, on some of the impacts of this cattle repair. So we're still in the learning curve for a lot of this. But just so you know, I've got some opinions, man. So let's move on. This is the classic Bradford pear tree, and we'll talk about this a little bit. But a lot of people love it, and for good reason, right? It's got some really pretty flowers. In the springtime, it provides a crazy pop of white. If you've ever, ever been around just one of these trees or grove of them, you know that they have quite an odor to them as well. And one of the most uh, amusing descriptors I have ever seen came from the Business Insider, where they said it smells like brown fish and semen. That is probably a personal opinion, but nonetheless, this tree has quite a pungent odor to it. Now, before we even talk about the issue of this tree in, in urban landscapes and yards and on the you know, the natural areas, we got to talk about fire blight because fire blight is really what set this whole cattle repair thing in motion uh, over a century ago. Fire blight is a bacteria, a really devastating bacterial disease. It affects a lot of the tree fruit and the rosaceae, your apples, your pears. And what this bacteria does is it causes this branch dieback on the tips. You can see here the fruit and the leaves have sort of browned up and shriveled um, this is what fire blight does. So you can see, obvious, obviously, this is a really important disease for the fruit tree industry. Now, back in the early 1900s, when we were just getting started in, in America, as far as our fruit tree industry, this was a really rampant disease. It was all over the place. We do know it is spread by pollinators, okay? So the bees are going and pollinating these fruits. They are unknowingly just getting some of this bacteria on them and taking it to other plants and other trees and other flowers and spreading this disease, uh, you know, sort of bug foot by bug foot. And we got to a point where the industry needed help. The pear industry was about spent at that point right around 1900 and we needed help. We needed something to be able to keep producing these pears and keep in mind the pears we use for fruit are from Europe. So they're Eurasian pears. Uh, the industry needed help to keep these alive. So they did know of uh, of, through various channels, they knew of a pear species, Pyrus caloriana, otherwise known as the calorie pear. It was native to Asia, China, Japan, and Korea, and it was resistant to fire blight. So it was introduced here to try to halt the disease. They brought in a couple specimens and they, they grafted them with the European pears, and they realized that it worked. It conferred that resistance pretty well. But more specimens were needed uh, for for more experiments beyond this little anecdotal information that they had. So that's where this fella comes into play. Frank Meyer, he lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He worked for the USDA Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction Office. Now you are reading that correctly because at the time the USDA had a, a group and, um, that their only job was to go to foreign places collect things and bring them back here. In fact, their mission was to locate and import economically important plants from other regions of the world. Obviously, that would not fly in today's day and age, but back at the, you know, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we knew much less than we know now. So Frank worked for the USDA. He made many, many, many collecting trips over to China in search of these things. And he actually brought over 2,500 plants to the US if you look down there by his feet, you see several, a couple burlap bags with trees inside them. Those are actually burlap bags full of dormant Pyrus caloriana seedlings that he had collected in the mountainous regions of China, and he was en route to bring them back here. He did so much for the industry, for not just you know the nursery industry, but for, for all of, a lot of the USDA, that he was actually the man they named this Frank Meyer Medal for Plant Genetic Resources after. He helped propagate a lot of different things, did a lot of collections. If any of you have ever eaten a Meyer lemon, that is the Meyer that the lemon is named after. So he was a very, very important person in our agricultural sector. Keep in mind, back in the day, it was not, uh, it was not thought negatively to go somewhere and bring a plant back. So it worked. All of Mr. Meyer's Pyrus caloriana helped save the pear industry. The way they did that was by grafting. So they would take a scion from an edible pear, uh, often Pyrus communists. They would take a rootstock from a calorie pear, and then they would graft those together just using your standard 
acting techniques. You can see on the right there, they sort of make a couple slits and incisions and slide those together and then, and then tape them together and the tree eventually grows together. And then that's how you have that, that grafted tree. So they did that, but then of course, uh, there were several outplantings located at the US Plant Introduction Station in Glendale, Maryland. And these outplantings were simply where they would take all of the pyrus calorina plants they weren't currently using and just plant them in the ground to keep them, keep them alive. So we had this great big field of pyrus calorina growing up there in Maryland. And the horticulturalist there, John Creech, started, you know, was there. He worked on the facility and he started looking around and he noticed some of these selections had really good horticultural value. They were disease resistant, they were drought resistant, they seemed to be pollution resistant, and they were just very, very hardy. Now, most of the pyrus calriana uh, from the native range have thorns. That is just one of their characteristics. But Mr. Creech, found one that was thornless. So he found this one tree that was thornless, it was pretty, and it was basically unkillable, okay? He then named it Bradford after the former station director. So this guy, John Creech, is honestly who we have to blame for the whole Bradford Parish we have in this country at this point. So Bradford pears are made the same way we make, uh, we make any type of, of tree like this, we do grafting, right? So every Bradford pear comes from the same individual. So you've got a scion or a shoot from Bradford. You've got a rootstock from Pyrus calriana. Now keep in mind, all of these rootstocks are different genetics. So every Bradford pear you have out there, the top part is the same genetics as every other Bradford. The bottom, the rootstock, is, is any P. calriana from that species. So you've got all different genetics below ground, identical genetics above ground. And this is going to come into play in just a little bit here. So that was how the Bradford pear was created. Okay, so it was commercially released in 1961. It was first noted that it escaped cultivation in Arkansas in 1964. And 1965 in Maryland, they noticed that it escaped cultivation and started growing in places that it had not been planted. Structural problems with the tree were noticed in the early 1980s, and one little figure, as of 2009, it was responsible for about $23 million in sales uh, in the U.S. alone. It's a major, major uh, ar arborist street tree that was planted all over the place. Many new cultivars have been created, Chanticleer, Aristocrat, the list goes on and on. Here's what they knew about the Bradford pear back in the day. They knew that around 25 to 30 years old, this thing had some structure issues. And that's because the way these grow, if you've ever seen them, you've got kind of a short, stocky stump part of it, a short stem that grows up, and then all these branches come basically straight up out of that. And it creates really, really strong, uh, or I should say, tight branch angles, which are extremely weak. If you look at this thing wrong, branches break off. If the wind blows wrong, branches break off. Ice, snow, all of that causes this thing to just crack and lose branches all over the place. So they knew this, okay? They knew this even though they marketed it as a great street tree. They also knew that if you plant only Bradford pear, you will not get a viable seed. And remember back, the top of every Bradford pear is identical, identical genetically. So those things are self-incompatible. If you do have two Bradford pears, they, you cannot get a viable seed. But if you have any other pyrus, with a Bradford, you can get a viable seed. What that means is if you have three streets and every house on that street has a Bradford pear and there are only Bradford pears there and you're not gonna get any pollen or anything coming in from bees coming outside, you will not get a viable seed out of this situation. All it takes is one person to plant a different cultivar, a Chanticleer. Then theoretically one little bee could go to that Chanticleer, get a bunch of pollen, go and pollinate every other Bradford pear along those streets, and all of them would then make viable seeds. They knew this, but their response was less than optimal. They just sort of said, well, it's not really our problem. I believe one of Creech's quotes was, yes, this tree has some deficiencies, but think of how many kids it has put through college. So it's strictly 
became a monetary issue. The sad thing is, and this is in a paper by Teresa Cully, when you look back at some of the diary entries that, that, that Frank Meyer wrote, he forecasted this whole thing. And I want to just read a little bit of this. Pyrus Calariana, this is written by Frank Meyer. Pyrus Calariana is simply a marvel. One finds it growing under all sorts of conditions, one time under high sterile mountain slopes, then again with its roots in standing water at the edge of a pond, sometimes in open pine forests, then again among scrub on bluestone ledges in the burning sun, sometimes in low bamboo jungle, and then again along the course of a fast-flowing mountain stream or in the occasionally burned over slope of a pebbly hill. This, this already tells us that this thing has the capacity to survive basically everywhere. Okay, so right now we've got people, and again, hindsight being 2020, but a tree was introduced into our urban landscape that can survive pretty much anywhere. The next part of his entry says, the tree is found nowhere in groves. All we scattered as specimens and but very few large trees were seen. And this is a big difference in Pyrus caloriana growing in its native range of China tree in Japan versus over here as a true invasive species. Over there, it was not aggressive, right? It can grow everywhere, but you don't see it in big groves. But now that it gets here, we have this stuff everywhere. We've got old fields that have been completely covered with Pyrus caloriana. You can see calorie repair here all over this old field. Along roadsides, this is a roadside on my way to, to Clemson here. You can see all those white and whitish green trees. This is a whole grove of Pyrus caloriana. This is growing exactly opposite to what Frank Meyer observed in China, right? Big groves like this. Other places we really see this are old abandoned lots, unsold lots, whether on the edge of town, this is just outside of Madison, Georgia, could be in town. Uh, alarmingly, we are seeing it grow in forests. This is near Columbia, South Carolina. All these green understory trees are calorie pear, creeping into the forest from the edge where there is a fairly large calorie pear population. And if we're being honest, this is a map from EdMaps, it is incomplete. According to this map, we only have calorie repair in five counties in South Carolina. And I can tell you that is absolutely not the case. It is in most counties in South Carolina. And if you look at this, you know, EdMaps is an amazing tool. It's an amazing tool. But it relies on people giving data to it. There are some researchers working with EdMaps to try to predict what is going to happen. So they have what we call the future range. And that is actually closer to what we are seeing now with Pyrus, Pyrus caloriana. The future range for calorie pair is much more accurate than the current range that we see here. So on that note, if you use EdMaps, thank you so much. If you don't use EdMaps, I strongly encourage you to download this app. It's free. It's simple. We rely on good mapping data when we go to our state boards to say this tree is a problem. We rely on this good mapping data when we go to other regulatory agencies to say, hey, we have a problem here. One of the issues we face in South Carolina is when we try to go to our, our, our state legislator folks and say, hey, calorie repair is a big problem. They look at what map do they have at EdMaps and they say, it's only in six counties. How can that be a problem? So having that accurate data is super, super important for all sorts of people. So there's my map plug for the day. Now, who really cares, right? This is a tree that grows out in the wild. It's got beautiful flowers. And believe me, you will talk to some people who love this thing, and they cannot believe that you would ever lift a finger to try to get rid of it. Um, yes, it's pretty. I get that. But to me, the negatives far, far, far outweigh the positives here. There's these thorns all over this thing, and this is just a sampling of the thorns. Uh, these are extremely sharp. These will draw blood quite easily. They have also been known to puncture tires. So we have talked to a lot of different people here in South Carolina and in Georgia as they are trying to clear old fields that have calorie pairs in them. They end up spending a lot of money on tires, you know, for tractors, for pickup. The only way you're going to get around that is to have some sort of tracked vehicle like a Caterpillar or something. Not everyone has that. Those are expensive. So these thorns are a big issue for the tires. They're also very, very invasive. Okay, this is just a, a little picture I took underneath 
to Calorie Pear Grove. And we're actually working with some folks from the University of Tennessee. Uh, Shawani is a grad student that's working with us, and she's been doing a big genetic analysis of calorie pear across the eastern part of the U.S. And what she found is a bunch of things that all suggest that this is a very, very invasive tree. High gene flow, high number of alleles, high number of private alleles, which means within the population, how many is there? All in all, it's got a really high genetic diversity, and this contributes to it being very invasive now that it's here. A good picture of this is right here. I took this picture just this morning. You can see right down here we've got one calorie pear that is blooming. I can tell you that every other, almost every other non-green tree there is a calorie pear. It just so happens that, you, that, you, that uh, the genetics of this particular tree are having it bloom a little bit earlier. But all those other reddish trees you see there, those are all calorie pear. This place will be white in a few days with the temperatures we're having. So you've got a lot of genetic diversity out there. It also grows extremely thick in groves, right? This is something that was not noticed back in China or Korea, Japan. But now that it's here, it grows in these thick groves. And if you look up, you are getting a lot of sunlight blocked out of here because sunlight just can't get through. And what happens when sunlight's not getting through? You're getting these dense you know, it's so dense up there, the understory is not regenerating. And the only thing that will regenerate there is more calorie pair. So that's, that's a problem. The other thing we're seeing is we're even seeing this in some of the agricultural sectors. Okay, we're seeing this. This is a, a, a horse farm we have up in near Spartanburg, South Carolina. This is, uh, I forget the horse's name. It's Trish or something like that. But anyway, this poor little horse was out there running around and at one point stepped on one of these calorie pairs. All the little bushes you see in that field are calorie pairs. And this horse stepped on it, got a major foot infection. In other case, this particular farmer and his wife, they had some ponies that were out there running around and they got their faces all scraped up because they didn't realize uh, what these were. And this kind of uh, speaks to the fact that a lot of people don't seem to know the issues with cattle repair and what to do about them because these trees that they have here, they were simply cutting them off at the ground every year, piling them up and burning them. But this just takes care of them for one year. The next year they grow up again. And as I looked out a little bit more, you can see down there on kind of the lower left, you can see what I showed you just before. And these are two great big mature cattle repair trees. And what this is, is just providing one great big seed source for the entire field they have there. Uh, these folks were not even aware that you know point A led to point B. So after I told them that, they said, oh, well, why don't we just cut down the big ones? I said, that will probably help quite a bit, yes. Um, so there's a big issue right now with making sure people know what to do and how to effectively manage this thing. From a more ecological perspective, there's the bird issue. Okay, so most birds depend on insects to raise their young, okay? And they eat a lot. It takes, you know, chickadees are a little bird. It takes several thousand caterpillars just to raise one clutch of chickadees. Um, we also know that where there are more non-native plants, you're going to have less insects, okay? So there was a paper that came out that quantified this pretty well not too long ago. And they looked at a bunch of yards in the D.C. area, and they looked at how many non-native species were growing in these yards. So on this graph, as it goes up the y-axis here, you've got uh, more baby birds as it gets higher. You've got more na non-native plants this way. So you can see, as you increase the number of non-native plants in an area, you get less baby birds. And that is basically because nothing eats non-native things. We don't have stuff here that eats non-native stuff, right? And if nothing is eating it, then birds don't have anything to eat. And this goes beyond calorie pear. This goes to the privets. This goes to the non-native trees, the nandina, all the non-native things people plant in their yard because it's pretty. One of the reasons it works here is because there are not insects or herbivores that have evolved with it to eat it. So when we bring stuff over from Europe, from China, because it looks good and the leaves always look good, it's because there, isn't, there aren't any insects here that will eat that stuff. So now, what do we do with calorie pear? It is pretty much everywhere at this place, at this point, and we are, we are beyond the point when we can stop it from getting wild. Uh, calorie pear is a permanent 
part of our native ecosystem, of our ecosystem at this point. It will never be native, but it is a permanent part. So what do we do? Okay, at this point, we are trying to figure out how to manage it. And in most cases, that means to kill it. Now, down here in the south, we love to kill stuff with fire. Can you kill this with fire? Uh, I have good news and bad news. You can top kill it, yes, but you will just make it angry. And there was some good data that came out of Indiana a couple years ago. Uh, that showed for every stem of a calorie pear that was burned off by a prescribed fire, four resprouts came back. So yes, you can run a prescribed fire over it, but you're going to create calorie pear bushes coming up behind you. Um, now, we're not, not completely dissing uh, fire because I, I think there's a place for it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But fire alone will top kill it. It will just make it come back angry. Now, most of these sprouts also were fairly small diameter. I think they were, oh, if I'm remembering right, an inch or so diameter, a lot of small ones. I don't know if we even have an idea if this will kill larger diameter trees. And I'm talking, you know, four, five, six inches at the base because they get fairly beefy. I don't know that we know how that will work. Can biocontrol work? This is some information I got from Dr. Dr. Doug Talmy at the University of Delaware. He did a very informal survey around his neighborhood, basically. And he looked at three different kinds of trees and he looked at them for a fixed, uh, fixed time. Just did a quick caterpillar survey and that's what he saw. On the white oaks, he found 233 caterpillars from 15 species. On the black cherry, he found 53 caterpillars out of 10 species. Now, both of those trees are native to North America, white oak and black cherry. And on the calorie pears, he found one caterpillar. I am convinced this caterpillar was just lost because I have yet to see much eating calorie pear. Um, and in all the times I've looked at calorie pear, here are the things I've seen eating. I've seen aphids on there. Okay, there's plenty of aphids. Now, are they gonna do any real damage to a calorie pear? No, no, absolutely not. They're gonna maybe make a, uh, one of the branches get a little scuzzy and curl up some leaves, but that is mostly all they are gonna do. I've seen thrips on there, I believe. Now, I didn't actually see the thrips, but that leaf, the way those leaf edges curl is fairly consistent with all the other thrips damage I've seen in the greenhouse. So I'm assuming those are probably thrips. And the other things I've seen, well, that's actually it. I've seen nothing else on calorie pear other than aphids and probably thrips. So we've got two, at this point, there's two pieces of anecdotal data that suggest nothing eats this thing. So we're trying to test this out. We're using some generalist insects. I'm working with Dr. Jess Hartshorn here in uh, the Clemson Forestry Environmental Conservation Department. We are looking at fall webworm, forest tent caterpillar, and fall cankerworm. These are three common native caterpillar species to the southeastern U.S. They are highly prolific. They eat lots and lots and lots of different things. We are subjecting them to a series of lab assays. So here you can see uh, we take leaf discs from different things. We put some caterpillars in there. In one case, we let them make a choice. Do you want to eat plant A, B, C, D, or E? And in other cases, we put the caterpillars in there with only one type of food, and we try to figure out what are they going to do if they have only one thing to eat. Will they eat it? Will they not eat it? What's the deal? So we've gotten one round done. We have done our fall webworm. What we learned there was when given the choice, they do not choose calorie pear. And if given no option, most of them would rather die than eat calorie pear. So calorie pear, at least for that species, really is fairly uh, inedible. Now, whether they just don't like the taste or can't uh, chew it or digest it, that's another question we don't know. But we know that if challenged with those types of leaves, they're simply not going to eat it. Uh, we are working on caterpillar. We just received our egg masses from Kelly Oton at the NC4. Forest Service, so we'll do that, and fall uh, cankerworm here this summer. So nothing's going to eat it. Biocontrol is not going to be, um, you know, unless we find something new, biocontrol is probably not going to be an option for calorie repair control. Cut it down. Can we cut it down? Absolutely you can cut it down. You can cut anything down, right? But if you do, just be sure to use proper safety, et cetera, et cetera. If you do cut it down, you are only halfway there. Because if you just cut it down and do nothing else, you're going to get a furious bunch of resprouts coming up out of there. That stump is going to resprout from basically every side. 
every large root from that calorie pair, if that large root is anywhere near the soil surface, it is going to send up more shoots. Okay, so you will get a, a field, a furious bevy of young calorie pairs coming up afterwards. So if you do cut that thing down, you've got to use herbicide. Okay, you've got to use some sort of stump treatment on there. One of the things we're looking at here in uh, South Carolina is when can you cut it down? You know, in, the, in a perfect world, you do this stuff kind of as it's just getting rolling there in the spring or maybe later in the summer, but that's when a lot of the forestry crews are busy. So we're looking at can you cut it down in the middle of summer, let it re-sprout a little bit, and then come back and treat it with a full herbicide. Okay, here's the other question. Do you need to use a stump, stump treatment type herbicide, or can you just cut it down at which level where it's kind of comfortable with the chainsaw and come back and foliarly treat those sprouts. We are trying to work on that to see if that is a, a viable option. We know it's going to depend on the size of the tree as well. There's some really big calorie pairs in some of these plots. Uh, this plot I'm showing you right here, there were calorie pairs that were 10, 12, 14 inches in DBH. It was some of the biggest stuff I'd seen. What about just spraying it? So this seems logical. We've got a project with the South Carolina Forestry Commission and the Georgia Forestry Commission and the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. We've got three study sites. We've got Milledgeville, Georgia, up there at Westminster, South Carolina, and then again at Liberty, a couple places up here in the upstate. And we've got these fields of calorie pair. And you can see here that I've sort of mowed a path in between them. So we would find, uh, you know, five, eight, 10, 12 acre fields. We would sort of cut out our, our borders to our plots and then each of those plots would get a different treatment okay and we've got our preliminary data here at this point and here is what it shows so on this graph the blue sorry the red is the survival at the starting point so you can see every treatment had 100 percent survival when we started and the blue bar is the survival after several months uh, of an herbicide treatment and you can see most all the herbicides worked right so we had uh, on the very bottom, you can see the um, you can see the trade name, and on the top, I actually put the active ingredient. So imagine the pure worked great. Chopper is a foliar application, 100% control. You can see the second bar there. None of the controls died. None of the control trees. Where you had garland and milestone as a basal bark, that's triclopyr plus amino pyralid. You had pretty good control. About uh, 10 to 15% survived. Basil bark with triclopyr, garlon 4, you had, you know, 5% survival. Uh, glyphosate foliar, um, almost 100% survival there. So the foliar stuff works really well. Um, and then there's a soil active Velpar, hexazinone, and that worked really well too. I mean, we had really good control. So one thing to, to keep in mind here is, you know, calorie pear is not some superhero plant. It can be controlled. It can be killed. It just takes, it takes resources. It takes the time to go out there and do it. It takes the chemical, uh, and it takes, you know, just putting the effort into actually killing. thing. Of course, then there's the issue of the thorns, right? So you've got these trees that are extremely thorny. If you just kill them and leave them standing, then A, it's great. You've got this thing dead. But now you've got a field with a bunch of dead, thorny trees sitting in there, and you still have to worry about getting those removed. Um, so that is definitely an issue, and there's not a real good, um, not a real good answer to that little conundrum just yet. Which brings us to there's a lot of questions with these control techniques. Okay, there's a lot of anecdotal information. Everybody seems to have their own little recipe and concoction for killing stuff. Right? We use this and we use this. The problem is there's not a lot of replicated studies. And people don't always share what they have been doing. And that's why I put sharing as caring. I would love to know if there are people that have figured out what works. And, and it would be great to try to get some, some control recommendations put together for landowners. Because right now, we don't have any real good data on what works in what area. We're not really certain about the optimal timing for each active ingredient. Right now, in, in theory, Doing it in the spring when those uh, leaves are fresh and just coming out, out seems like it would be a great idea, but it might be that doing it in the heat of summer is also real real good. And it might be if you put the right 
uh, sticker and surfactant in there, you can have a fall application and make a go of it too. So these are some other things uh, we're trying to figure out for each of those active ingredients. We know they work. What is the best time to apply those? We also don't know about the impact of tree size on active ingredient efficacy. You know, in a, foliar applications are great if it's a tree that's small enough to safely treat. Because you don't want people out there with a backpack sprayer trying to hold the wand over their head, spraying stuff that's over their head. Uh, especially backpack sprayers are much more, they are meant to treat stuff that is lower to the ground, just from a safety perspective. As the tree gets bigger, how big is too big for certain active ingredients, right? Can you just spray the bottom half of what you can safely reach? If you've got a tree that's 10 feet tall, can you just spray the bottom four to five feet of that crown and actually get control? We just simply don't know that yet. And then the integrated pest management programs. This is, in my opinion, where things are going to have to go. I think fire and herbicide has a, has a really good chance to work together. We know fire is going to top kill a lot of that stuff. And I think one thing that might be worth doing is, is if you can, if you've got, you know, say, a 10-acre old field that's got a bunch of calorie repair in there, if you can run a fire through there, top kill all that stuff, and then come back and follow it up with an herbicide treat. I think that's going to give you, I think that will give you pretty good control. And I say that for a couple of reasons. You're going to have that tree expending a bunch of energy from the roots, re-sprouting all the stuff that was top killed. So it's already going to be a little stressed because it's going to re-sprout. Remember, if you do this, make sure that there's at least, you know, 18 to 24 inches of new growth when you use that herbicide because you want to make sure there's enough leaf area to take in enough of that herbicide that can actually kill that root. The other thing that we're, we found we've got some preliminary data looking at the strength of the thorns and uh, one of the undergrads we're working with here Braden he has been looking at how strong are thorns from the cattle repair under different situations and he took you know a live thorn a thorn that had been dead sitting here and then thorns that had had a prescribed fire run over them and he found that after a fire runs over those thorns they become much weaker and rather than have the strength to puncture a tire a lot of times they will snap off so I really think that, that there's some, some possibilities here by using fire plus herbicide. You're going to put extra stress and extra impact on the tree's survival, and you're also going to make that tree less likely to puncture tires, cause injury, cause damage, and cost the landowner a lot more money. This is something we're working on quite a bit to try to figure out how do all these pieces of the puzzle fit together. I think somewhere there's a good... Um, you know, at some point we'll have a good flow chart if you have trees of this size in this area. This is what you do and we're working on all that stuff. Now, community engagement. This Bradford Pear Bounty Program, Molly mentioned it early in the introduction, but this is something in the city of Fayetteville and also in St. Louis, Missouri, they did this last year. There are an amazing number of people, well, it may not amaze you, it amazed me, that did not that do not make the connection between their Bradford pears and their calorie pears. Um, people see the Bradford pear as this nice little street tree. They see calorie pear as a pretty little thing out in the woods and out in the roadsides, but they don't make the connection that the Bradford pear is the big reason why we have calorie pear here. Part of that is because Bradford, you know, is marketed as being sterile. And yes, if you have two healthy Bradfords there, you are not going to get uh, any viable seeds. All it takes, though, is for one of those trees to have a root sprout, right? One of those sprouts that comes off the root, that is no longer a Bradford. That is whatever genetics are in that Pyrus Caliana. It is completely possible for a sprout from a root to go up and pollinate the top of the tree that it's on, okay? This makes viable seed. It's got two different genetics there. A lot of birds eat these seeds, and this is how this stuff gets spread all over the place. Is birds eat seeds, birds fly, birds poop, nature takes its course, and stuff grows, right? So we just tried to model this program after Fayetteville. We created our own, our own Bradford Pear Bounty Program. And what we're doing, uh, we set up the website and the whole, whole thing, and we're trying to get people, trying to, to make a couple things happen. First of all, we're trying to help diversify our urban canopy. Okay, a lot of the urban canopy has gone through 
a lot of iterations over the years. At one point, there were elms everywhere. Then Dutch elm disease came and, and wiped out a lot of those. And a lot of that was replaced with ash. Of course, emerald ash borer came and wiped out a whole bunch of those. Um, and it's, there's a, in a lot of cases, the urban tree canopy is not all that diverse. We are trying to help diversify that urban tree canopy. We are giving people in the Clemson area, both within the city and the surrounding area, if you cut down your Bradford tree, Bradford pear tree while it's in bloom, take a selfie with it. Just take a picture of you with that cut down pear tree, bring it into our event on February 29th. We will give you a free tree. And we're getting three to five gallon potted trees. We've got 10 different uh, tree species on there. And these are just species we chose based on the upstate of South Carolina. So there's some oaks, there's a bald cypress, there's a magnolia, there's uh, you know, uh, redwood, that type of thing, black gum. But the, the point is, A, to get people to try to diversify and put some native trees in the urban area. It's also to educate them and tell them and show them the link between the calorie pear problem we have in all the natural areas and the Bradford pear tree in their yard. And that's the two things we're hoping to get out of this. And this has gotten quite a bit of publicity online and that type of thing. And the vast, vast, vast majority of comments have been incredibly supportive. Um, I would say less than 1% of the comments are, are to the effect of, I love my bread from Paris, it's so pretty. Most people want to burn it down and cut it down and do all sorts of things to it. So we feel like this program has really got a good shot to, um, you know, to, have, to, to take hold and hopefully do it in some other places as well. If anyone would like to do something like this in their town, I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. So here's, here's what we know. Uh, as we can. Again, like I said, we are still somewhat in our infancy as far as what do we do about calorie repair. We know fire alone is not going to work. Okay, that's, again, just going to make it angry. You're going to have a whole, whole bunch of other stuff coming up afterwards. We know that herbicides do work. Okay? Uh, we also know that we need to refine some of these techniques. We need to figure out what combinations, what active ingredients based on the size, based on the location. Um, all of that type of stuff. And especially knowing, you know, in the in a natural area, an old field, it's one thing, it's easy to run a fire through there. You're not gonna be able to do that in a horse pasture, right? There's not enough fuel, you're not gonna burn that thing. So, you know, so they are in a situation now where they really do have to physically cut off and remove, you know, either kill it with a, a foliar before and then remove what's dead or cut it all off and do a, a stem treatment, a stump treatment on it. Either way, when you've got something like pasture, you're gonna to have to do manual removal to get that stuff out of there. We don't know much about other control methods. You know, from what we can tell, uh, there's really nothing silvicultural you can do to grow in there other than maybe keep, you know, in some of those pine forests, I showed that picture of the pines and lines that had calorie repair in there. If that's being burned on a fairly consistent schedule, you may be able to keep that stuff under control. Um, the fire, uh, the, the thing doesn't grow extremely strong thorns right off the bat. You've got a few months or maybe even a year there before they get extremely tough, but it would require really uh, consistent repeated burning to try to keep it off. And then maybe you can eventually wear it on that root. We honestly just don't know yet. And again, that combination of fire plus herbicide, I really think that's got some legs. We're trying to get some studies in to look at that, but I think there's a, a possibility there Partially because we do so much prescribed fire in the southeast anyway. It seems like a natural fit. If you can use that prescribed fire somewhere, you can help control some of this calorie repair. And then also there's the community engagement. Um, as I said, we'll never get rid of calorie repair, but I think it does a it, it's part of our duty, especially as extension folks, to try to let people know what is happening around them. Address this problem from that urban perspective trying to close that massive disconnect of people that, that do not know the Bradford pear leads to calorie pear, that calorie pear is in any way, shape, or form related to Bradford pear. Um, part of our job is to educate and to let people know and to try to encourage safe native plantings. Uh, the thing that always bugs me is there's so many great native tree options in the southern, especially in the southern part of the U.S. You've got so many options. Don't just put a a non-native in there just because that's what everyone else on the street has. And that gets to the, the last point. Can you reduce or even stop planting high-risk calorie cultivars and managed landscapes? 
this will get to a state by state um, issue as far as what is allowed to be planted. It is part of an agricultural commodity, which, which makes it a little trickier. And I know every state has a different set of regulations and rules. Uh, some states have started banning the planting of non-native things. Um, this is something that I strongly support and hope we can make happen here in South Carolina as well. My collaborators have been great because they are supportive of all this and we're getting a lot of good work done. But like I said, we're still on the very front end of what needs to happen here with the cattle repair. With that, I do love questions and I would be happy to take any of them. So thank you, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Coyle. That was tremendously informative. We got a ton of questions here from folks. Um, so we are going to try and hit as many as we can. All right, let's um, go. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, all right, do calorie pairs produce fruit? Yes, they sure do. Uh, once, a, once a calorie pair becomes a calorie pair, it will produce a viable fruit. Um, the only time you don't get a viable fruit is if you have, if you have two of the exact same um, cultivars. So two Bradfords cannot produce a fruit. They're self-incompatible. Two Chanticleers could not produce a viable fruit. But a Bradford plus a Chanticleer can produce a viable fruit. Okay. And actually, that feeds into another question we got. Can you define again what a Chanticleer is? It is simply another cultivar of a, of a calorie pair. So Bradford... They chose the Bradford tree back, you know, in the 50s, and every Bradford is the exact same genetics as that. That's how every cultivar is made. So at one point, someone chose a tree and named it Chanticleer, and every Chanticleer is made from that one set of genetic material, that one plant. Every aristocrat is from that one single plant. So it, it's something that has the same genetic makeup as all the others. And again, okay. this is just this is just the top of the tree, right? Because the root stock is just random Pyrus caloriana. Whatever they had around, they grafted a Chanticleer scion onto it, and that's what they made. Okay, yeah, that, that clears it up. Uh, okay, so are these trees um, classified as an early successional tree in the forest? Yeah, they would be. They, I don't know if they're officially classified as that, but they show all the characteristics of an early successional. They are extremely quick to establish anywhere, especially in disturbed areas. Uh, they grow incredibly fast. They can make uh, seeds starting at like three years old, you know, and I've seen them as, as small as about as tall as me, about six feet tall with fruit on there already. So they're, they're an incredibly fast, fast moving species. Um, it's kind of a, a live fast, die young type of thing, though. They don't get very old, and like you saw in the pictures, they will break once they start getting a little bigger. They break off pretty easy. And so can these trees survive under a canopy of climax trees, or do they even get to that age? Yeah. Uh, not, you know, I think they can, but I do not see many getting to that age. Now, I'm thinking of um, those small all ones we saw in that pine forest and down by Columbia. Now those are smaller and there was some sunlight getting in there because that pine forest wasn't, you know, completely closed canopy. But also I've seen those, those bigger ones survive underneath there. And it seems like they can survive in pretty low light. You know, they, they really do show all the characteristics of a really hardy invasive species that way. Okay. But again, I don't, I don't know that we see them a lot in a closed canopy. Okay, this one might be a little bit difficult, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So how invasive are these trees com when compared to other invasives in the area like Tree of Heaven? I guess if there was a scale of how problematic these are, are they as much of a concern as Tree of Heaven? I would argue, and here's where the dude has opinions, right? So yeah. I, would argue, I would argue they're worse than Tree of Heaven. Um, they're extremely aggressive, extremely quick to grow and spread and take over an area. And I mean, we could certainly argue which, which is worse. They are on the, the level of the worst ones we have, in my opinion, in the southeastern US. They're, they're right at the top with whatever else you want to put up there. Um, part of that is just because of how thick they grow and they grow into big thorny thickets. And a lot of people, if they want to reclaim a, 
you know, an acreage from them, you've got to get a big grinder in there on top of a tracked vehicle. And that's right. really that's really expensive. You know, not not everybody can afford to do that, but that's pretty much what you need to do at this point if you want to, you know, if you've got a a field with a bunch of four to eight to twelve foot tall trees, you're gonna need to physically remove them by hand or with just a great big chipper grinder. And that's not cheap. So that's a good point. Yeah, they're, they're really hard to hard to manage. And because of how they grow, especially in that open field area, they have branches almost all the way down to the ground. It makes things like a hack and squirt treatment, which you could do for a tree of heaven because you can get to that stem pretty easily. You can't really do that with um, cal repair. You've got to do stuff you could spray in there. You can do a stump treatment by kind of getting your wand in there, but you're going to get cut up a little bit when you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So people are wondering, um, have you seen girdling to be effective in the absence of herbicide or hack and squirt or any of these other methods? If you just girdle a tree, a calorie pair without herbicide, it's just going to sprout from below the girdle and on the roots. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, so that'll top kill it all is all you'll, you'll, and, and from what I have seen, every, every injury to the top of the tree just makes it, makes the sprouts come back even more aggressively. And you know, you might just have one stem there, but if you kill or girdle that stem, you're gonna get sprouts from the the stump itself, the stem itself. But also, like I said, all of those large structural roots that are close to the top of the ground, they are gonna send up shoots too. They are tough. Okay, okay, let's see. Um, Do you know if there is an economic use for these trees, any that you're aware of? None, none to my knowledge. Um, I, have, okay. I have, I have, I've seen that some people like to take the wood and turn, uh, you know, wood, wood carved bowls out of them. Um, I'm actually trying to work with a fella here at Clemson. We've got a meeting next week. He tests. Um, he's in the food science department. So one of my colleagues and I were saying, well, it's a fruit tree. Can you use the wood for smoking meat, right? Like you would apple or cherry or something. Well, we yeah. might, we might look into that. But I mean, at best there would be a niche market for it. And there's just as much as I would like to think there's enough meat being smoked to take care of these. There's just not that much being, you know, I mean, that's improbable. So not really. Yeah, that's a good idea. It is a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I hope it works, but yeah. <laughs> um, let me see. Sorry. I got lost here. Um, okay. This is more of a tree fruit question. So totally fine. If you don't know this offhand, um, do you know what rootstock um, one should look for to grow a pear tree that is not susceptible to blight? No. Yeah, I don't know either. Okay, <laughs> we'll, cir- we'll circle back to that. That is that is more ag, ask, more tree fruit. But ask, ask Louis. Ask Louis. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> my my husband's in the pear industry. I will. I will. I'll leave it in the chat box. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, oh, after cutting. Um, any thoughts on using black plastic or geotextiles to prevent regrowth of the sprouts that you were describing earlier? Um, maybe it would work. I've never tried it and I've never seen it tried. So okay. I don't know, maybe. Okay. And that's the thing. I don't, I don't know how, um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you've got something like bamboo. If you cut it, it's going to just punch its way through whatever is on top of it. On right. the other end of the spectrum, you've got stuff that will just completely wimp out and not do anything if you put a tissue over it. I don't know where bread for pear is as far as how strong is it um, to push up through. That would probably depend on how much, uh, you know, how big of a rootstock you're dealing with and how big of a tree you're dealing with. Sure. Um, have you gotten any pushback from industry, from the industry or greenhouses from your um, Bradford Pear Bounty event? Not yet, but okay. it's not over, so there's always time. <laughs> Everybody's got opinions. Yes, they do. Okay, I have a couple um, insecticide-related questions and some huh? just experiences and opinions. Um, so someone said that Tordon is what I used for the last 25 years on many deciduous trees, and they found it to be effective uh, with Bradford pear. Um, so that's I'm- just something to know. Uh-huh. Yep, I would I would agree. I used that when I was a kid. That's what we, they sent us out to the uh, fence lines with. You know, <laughs> cut down the box elders and put tordon on them. That stuff works pretty well on pretty much all those hardwoods. So that was would definitely be an option. Cool. Um, oh, oh, okay. Bear with this pronunciation. 
amino pyralids are mm-hmm. extremely persistent in the environment, aren't they? Someone asks. I believe they are, yes. Okay, so that's definitely something to be aware of, especially when you're near waterways. Waterways um, or, or in those ag, those ag uh, environments, right? If you're putting stuff in a pasture, you want to make sure you're putting the right thing in there uh, based on livestock needs and all that. Okay. Um, have you ever used weed wrenches um, uh, like the uprooter or polar bear? Um, have you used those to try and uproot these trees? I guess. Yeah, I, have not, ones I've seen. I have not used it on these, but they've got a pretty strong root system from what I have seen uh, with people digging them up with backhoes and stuff. It would probably work for smaller things, but, but again, here's a tree where if a, if a big enough chunk of root is left in the ground, that will sprout. There you go. So, so it's really difficult to physically remove them because they have such a strong sprouting capability. Um, and that's why I always recommend, look, it's great to try to put them up, but you're probably going to have to come back and spot treat with herbicide. Okay. You know, unless you really have you heard any... Anything. Sorry, go ahead. Mom. Yeah. No, no. Um, that That's a good point to note, too. Um, a few people are asking if you have um, any idea if goats eat it, eat calorie pear. I do not know if goats eat it. I do know that horses will sometimes nibble off the very top a uh, couple three inches of a of a like a yearling shoot but you know that really doesn't do anything to the plant i don't know if goats eat it um i just don't know okay okay um let's see okay we only got a couple more minutes here so let's finish off with something more general um i think that this is an important distinction to kind of talk about someone asked if animals do not eat invasive species why do birds eat and spread the seeds so when you refer to animals, you know, not being a natural control, yeah. what animals are you referring to there? Well, I'm talking about any any insect, really. Okay. Um, so that's a good question. So why, I don't know that I can answer why. I know that I can, um, you know, speak to privet as a good example, right? Privet makes a ton of seeds that birds, a lot of birds eat. Just because it eats something does not mean it's good for them. Um, I heard one bird person say that privet seeds are like the McDonald's of bird food. They love to eat it, they'll eat a ton, but they get very little nutritionally out of it. It could be that to birds, a seed is just a seed, and as long as it doesn't taste absolutely horrible, they'll eat it. Um, But I don't know why birds will eat these seeds and insects will not eat the the leaves. It's a very different system, you know, and and think of it this way. The plant is making seeds that it wants to be palatable because it wants to have them spread everywhere. The plant does not want to give up leaf area because that's what it uses to grow and make food. So a plant is not going to put defensive chemicals into fruit. At least most of them aren't because they want those fruit to be consumed and spread. But it is going to defend itself with leaves. Now, I don't know what the chemistry is of a, a pyrus calorianna leaf, but that is one sort of theory of why, you know, leaves and fruit are different. Like the plant is making that fruit in hopes that something takes it and spreads it away. It's making those leaves in hopes that it can protect it, protect them from everything else that tries to eat them. Oh, that's a, that's a really well, yeah, that's well described. Okay. Nice. Um, okay, everybody, I think that about finishes up our time. I'm seeing a lot of really excellent insecticide input and experiences still pouring in. Um, I am going to collect all of this and definitely share it with Dave. Um, I think this will be super helpful in his continuing research. Um, Thank you everybody for participating. We're gonna go ahead and let Dave go now. He has to run off to another meeting, Um, but I will be here for another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, If you have any issues getting back to step two or with the CEU stuff, or you just have follow-up questions you'd like me to pass on, please don't hesitate to contact me through this sh- um, through the chat window. And um, I know you can't hear them, Dave, but there is a resounding round of applause. I just know. <laughs> folks, so. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> and thanks, everybody. I'd be happy to talk to folks if you've got uh, more questions. I'm pretty easy to find. So, you know, feel free to get a hold of me. Love to talk to you about it. Excellent. Thanks. You have a good one, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.